Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for the invitation. It's really, it's a beautiful event uh, in a beautiful city on a cold and foggy day. Really nice, nice day to be inside. Uh, and, uh, so I'm, I'm going to continue bringing the marvelous. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so here's a talk. Uh, we're coming back to Sympoiesis, the grand theme of Donna's talk last night. I want to take uh, through Margulis's, uh, because this is a word that Lynn Margulis didn't use because it really wasn't in currency as she was doing her major thinking. But of course, symbiosis is, is the word that, uh, a symbiosis, symbiogenesis, these were the words that and the, and the concepts that Margulis developed. Uh, and and in the, the and so we're going to go back to the origin of the concept of symphoesis, which even in Beth Dempster, uh, in her original articulation, was a portmanteau uh, term combining symbiosis and autopoiesis. So we'll come back to these concepts, and I want to frame them then with uh, with uh, some thinking I've been doing that I that I've now given the grand title. In fact, this is now for take this for your program and call it Gaian Technics, okay? Uh, or uh, somewhat less grandiose uh, natural technics. So, but first, let's uh, take another look at marvelous life. What is life? Life is not a thing. Life is a process. It's a process that makes itself, and as far as we know, it's always based on cells. Cells may be as small as a millionth of a meter, which is a micron. And these things wrap themselves into structures of their own making. And intrinsic to life is the propensity to grow, to grow, to excrete, to exchange material, and to grow and to grow and to grow and this is life. Life is a way of behaving. Yes, it's material. Yes, there's DNA, there's RNA and many other chemicals. Yes, it's carbon-based. But dead life has got the same material as live life. What do I mean? If you have a bull and he's fighting the bullfighter, this is life. Five minutes later, the bull is dead there's no life there. The DNA is there, the carbon is there, the water is there, but the bull is dead. What has been lost? What has been lost is the process. And what is the process? It is the self-making process where components from the environment are taken in and moved around and changed chemically to do what? To make more. Why? To make more. Why? To make more. Life is always expanding always making more of itself. Now some people use a fancy word for this and they call it autopoiesis, that is the self-making. And this is a good word because this word tells us that the components are taken from the environment, the energy is taken from the environment, but by what? By the live thing. The live thing keeps moving, keep making more, keeps making more, keeps growing to make more, to grow, to reproduce, to hear the telephone, Stop, we have to start again. <laughs> so life is not the thing or the matter, because the matter is the same right after death. Life is the property of growing, of making oneself, making more of oneself, and so on. So what is the smallest, simplest unit, material, that can do this? This is a cell. We know of nothing less complicated then a cell that has this property of making more, of growing, of making more, of growing and eventually reproducing. But it's the self-making property of the materials, the chemicals interacting. Now what is a cell? We have at least 3,000 proteins, maybe more. We always have those proteins wrapped up in a membrane. Who makes the proteins and the membrane? The system itself. No one makes it from the outside. The system itself makes itself. Why? To make more to grow, to make more. Now this property of to grow, to make more, to wrap oneself and to make more and eventually to reproduce, this property is present in all life. 
Symbiosis is a very simple word and a very simple idea. It's simply the living together of unlike organisms. In fact, in the early definition, it was the living together of differently named organisms. For example, all over northern Siberia and northern Canada, one has the tundra, and the tundra is the food for the reindeer, and the people eat the reindeer. What is that food? That food is lichen. And as the early Russian botanists studied, what is this lichen? product of symbiosis. What does that mean? It means in the lichen you have the alga, which is the green part, which is making the food, and it's teamed up with the fungi, which is the white part, and the fungi is very boring looking fuzz, and the alga is very boring looking green material. And together, when they grow together, they form, by symbiosis, the lichen. The lichen looks like a plant. It's very similar to a plant. It used to be it used to be called a plant, but we know it's not a plant, it's the product of symbiosis. Now all biologists agree that the lichen formed by symbiogenesis. What is symbiogenesis? It is simply symbiosis leading to new kinds of evolution. What we now know, which is so different, in fact it's different from what many people are taught today, is that it's not just the lichen that is the product of symbiogenesis. It is all animal cells, all plant cells, all fungal cells, and all protoctus cells. That is, all life on Earth that is not bacteria is product of symbiogenesis. What does that mean? It means that very different sorts of organisms came together to make a new kind of being. Now, people who work with computers know this very well. You don't start all over making the modem. You don't start all over making the hard disk. You recombine already refined parts that were already developed by others and then you get something genuinely new all right so uh, lynn touches here uh, i'm going to draw out from her discussion just now three main topics that we'll take up so one is autopoiesis and growth, or technically she called this biotic potential. Uh, symbiosis uh, as embodied in the lichen. So we'll take a look at lichens a little bit. Uh, and then symbiogenesis uh, as evolutionary tinkering, you might say, or what I'm gonna be calling natural technicity. So, so, in Markowitz's major study, Symbiosis in Cell Evolution, she diagrams lichenization uh, here. And, and, and the usefulness of, in this diagram is that it shows how Markowitz uh, coordinated the concepts of symbiosis and autopoiesis, right? Uh, as you can see right on the diagram, and also how the, sim the lichen then as symbiogenetic holobiont right, is produced by the interaction of these separate but entangled processes. So in this case, the symbiogenetic holobiont is the lichen. This is the original symbiotic organism in the history of Western scientific terminology. That is the word symbiosis was invented to describe the lichen. So what is the lichen? The lichen consists of, as we see in the diagram here, two bions from separate biological kingdoms, always a fungus, uh, allied with a photosynthetic partner. And that partner can either be an alga or a bacterium. Two distinct autopoietic entities achieving integration and association in a composite body, unlike the body of either symbiont on its own. That's, uh, that's the specificity of what happens in a life. Now, but so the lichen association is not universal, but a highly specific arrangement. For instance, unlike the earlier permanent endosymbiotic incorporations at the evolutionary base of their fungal, and we'll just stick with the algae, 
for this discussion of their fungal and algal components, the life in symbiosis is not obligatory. So I'm saying when the proto-mitochondrion and the proto-chloroplast entered into the eukaryotic consortium, that was a permanent association. So that's now obligatory. You can't remove a mitochondrion from the eukaryotic cell and have it survive. It's, uh, but the lichen can come apart again. So, and uh, I don't, do I have a pointer, a, a light pointer? It's also, okay, great. So check this out. There it is. So to get a lichen, you got to start, it, it, let's say with an algal partner, you got to start over here, but the, the algae is a protus, right? It's a green algae. So because it, it's a, the photosynthetic partner, so you got to bring this green algae around here. So you make this anastomosis, technically speaking, you make this cross kingdom link between these two branches. Or you start over here, where you take a cyanobacterium as your photosynthetic partner, and you bring it up here at some or to get your fungal partner. So that's that's the further compli uh, complication going on with the lichen. So, so as, as we're saying, but the lichen symbiosis, the symbiosis that creates the lichen is not obligatory when conditions change, lichen symbionts may dissociate and go their separate ways. Lichen's basically a survival strategy for a desiccated environment. So what can account for the extraordinary contemporary intellectual vote for lichens? We're in the era of the lichen. Why? What does it mean? So in his recent essay, which I highly recommend by Derek Woods, Prosthetic Symbiosis, Woods notes that the extended significance of the lichens uh, currently abroad in the environmental humanities, uh, their appearance as charismatic beings of a certain sort. He writes, lichens are more than one life form among others. They are special because of their status as symbiotic organisms. They are symbols of future coexistence. Indeed, lichens have an ecotopian meaning. So this era of the lichen uh, was consolidated by this uh, uh, great essay that Donna mentioned last night by Gilbert Sapp and Tauber. Uh, a symbiotic view of life, we have never been individuals, which manifesto concludes with the memorable statements for animals as well as plants, there have never been individuals. We are all lichens. Okay, we are all lichens. So this can compress the equation and codes, uh, I would say the post-humanist metaphor behind the contemporary, if you will, allegory of the lichen. Humanity's lichen likeness. You like that? Uh, we are, if we're all lichens, then we must have some, uh, so, Humanity's like and likeness underpins some of the thinking in the current discourse of symbiosis, it seems to me. We are all likens insofar as we are also symbiotic beings in the sense of being symbiogenetic consortia of distinct biological entities. The allegory of the lichen symbiosis universalizes and socializes a humbly appealing vista of the good-natured interrelatedness that sustains and nurtures the world at large. Now, this next slide, uh, slide updates the narrative of lichen formation, just back to basic lichen science here. So note how the ability of the distinct bions, the fungus and the alga, their ability to enter into productive relations leading to metabolite exchange. Let's see here. 
Uh, yeah, there it is, just in the first two steps. Um, that this process is set off uh, by the release of signaling compounds in either of these organisms. These processes of recognition and nutrition may also be said to partake of, to be mediated by the cellular cognition that emerges from and so accompanies active autopoietic organizations. So the key thing to note in the lichen symbiosis is the maintenance of distinction between the biomes, even as the effective operation of their symbiotic association produces this third thing, the lichen thallus, the lichen cortex. So here you are in a nutshell, Sympoiesis emerges from symbiosis plus autopoiesis as incorporation plus differentiation. And this is how one builds a lichen. But if we press on the architectural <clears throat> or technical metaphor of building a lichen, we're reminded how Marcus construed the sense of symbiogenesis itself as a kind of evolutionary bricolage. Remember, at the end of our, the clip, she said, uh, all life on Earth that is not bacteria is a product of symbiogenesis. What does this mean? It means that very different sorts of organisms came together to make a new kind of being. Now, people who work with computers know this very well. You don't start all over making the modem. You don't start all over making the hard disk. You recombine already refined parts that were already developed by others, and then you get something new. So what I'm proposing here is that sympoiesis, the, the kind of sympoiesis that we're going to hear about in the next set of talks, uh, uh, these extended readings, I would call extended readings of the, the biological grounds of the idea of sympoiesis, may be seen as wider ecological and social mappings of the natural technicity afforded by symbiotic and symbiogenetic processes. And when taken to the level of the resulting aggregation, these Gaian, if you will, Gaian technicities built on the supplemental differentiation of symbiosis and autopoiesis nonetheless subvert the demarcation between natural and cultural constructions. We seem to find that our own human or animal lichen likeness is equally a product of our own technogenesis. So in this light, coming back to Derek Wood's prosthetic symbiosis, his theorization can help us to calculate the equation of sympoiesis with what I'm calling natural technicity. He writes, symbiosis is a kind of prosthesis or technological process. Lichens are non-human technologies. The fungus is a greenhouse for the alga, and the alga is a solar panel for the fungus, which is pretty cool. I mean, uh, there you have it. <laughs> Just in the diagram that came off the web there. Um, and, and this particular organic technology is possible precisely because in their autopoietic specificity, the symbionts remain formally bounded and mutually external to each other and thus suitable for discrete reorganization within an encompassing superstructure, which is the lichen. For even as the symbionts will be, in, in Wood's words, functionalized by the new lichen-like symbiotic unit, lichenization is fundamentally a technological process, as he says, in which one autopoietic life form externalizes functions into another. Now we can widen out from the uh, for a moment from the idiosyncrasies of the lichen with a glance at the further talents of the fungi detailed in Merlin Sheldrake's uh, very cool book, Entangled. <laughs> While lichenized fungi are uh, appeared in relatively dry or desiccated niches, 
Many other varieties of fungi supported a wide world of watery symbiotic regimes uh, at the basis of the evolution of those other major world-making photosynthesizers called land plants. Uh, and uh, Sheldrake writes, sometime around 600 million years ago, green algae, photosynthetic protists, began to move out of shallow freshwaters and onto the land. These were the ancestors of land plants, but the algal ancestors of land plants had no roots. It was only by striking up new relationships with fungi that the algae were able to make it onto land. So plants, too, have never been individuals because only the emergence of an association with fungi made it possible for aquatic algae to evolve into land plants in the first place, as in the lichen then fungal integration with photosynthetic algae maintained autopoietic differentiation while inducing the formation of coevolutionary organs, the tissues of plant roots as these were gradually unfolded from the affordances of symbiotic proximity. Sheldrake notes a technical prosthesis in this process, similar to uh, what Woods had observed, this time in the fungi plant symbiosis that has become known as the wood-wide web. Uh, by partnering, uh, Sheldrake writes, by partnering, plants gain a prosthetic fungus and fungi gain a prosthetic. Both, both use the other to extend their reach. It's an example of Lynn Margulis' long-lasting intimacy of strangers, except that they're hardly strangers anymore, as Lynn would say, give or take 100 million years. <laughs> so... Uh, Coming back now to the phenomenology of the lichen, Woods notes that their fungal and algal or bacterial partners, the autopoietic entities available for mutual prosthesis through the lichen symbiogenesis, that these organisms are phylogenetic, that is, they are organisms directly descended uh, by vertical heredity. So this is first memory in, in uh, in uh, what he's going to open up in, in Bernard Stiegler's scheme. Uh, but here's the difference. However, unlike their biotic components, the lichen itself is not phylogenetic, but epiphylogenetic. Woods writes, lichens, but not their fungi or algae, are already epiphylogenetic in Stiegler's sense of the term. For the French philosopher Bernard Stiegler, epiphylogenesis names the foundation of techniques in general as exteriorized information transfer systems, such as written in inscriptions in the human instance. Stiegler saw these devices of tertiary retention or third memory at the root of anthropogenesis, or the evolution of the human being, and Derek Woods now carries the process of prosthetic supplementation back to the conception of biological or organismal symbiosis. He defines prosthetic symbiosis as epiphylogenesis, perhaps here with a glance or an echo of Yuck Hui's cosmotechnics, as uh, in that he's sort of repeating some language that you see in that book. Uh, uh, recursivity and contingency. Uh, uh, but in, as Wood states, uh, defines prosthetics symbiosis as, epo, as epiphylogenesis as the organized inorganic that exteriorizes organic functions into technical objects and systems. So again, here autopoiesis pertains to the fungal and algal or bacterial symbionts, but not to the lichen symbiosis, which is both life, quote, both life and technical becoming. Or in Stiegler's phrase, quote, the pursuit of life by means other than life. 
Oops. Oh, that is my techniques. So in other words, there are no, to be quite precise, there are no lichen cells as such. There are only algal or bacterial and fungal cells that for the duration of their symbiotic consortium mutually induce each other to form a thallus and become a lichen. Thus the symbiotic lichen is as much a technical mediation as it is a biological organism. A communal housing project instructed by diverse actors. So this status of natural technical mediation is even clearer in the long hidden fungal plant symbioses at the roots of forests. But Sheldrake also marks some key distinctions between the lichen symbiosis and mycelial, the mycelial networks uh, at the roots of, of forests. He writes, whereas the partners in lichens, I got that up here. Oh, it's hanging. Here we go. Whereas the partners in lichens come together to make a body altogether unlike those of their individual members, the partners in a mycorrhizal relationship do not. Plants stay recognizable as plants, and mycorrhizal fungi stay recognizable as fungi. This makes for a very different, more promiscuous type of symbiosis. So in this form of non-obligatory mutualism, soil-born sympoiesis denotes an open-ended networking of cellular contacts among diverse plant, fungal, protestin, and bacterial actors. So summing up now, Cross-kingdom symbioses typically interconnect members of two or more different prokaryotic or eukaryotic kingdoms alongside a mutual boundedness that maintains autopoietic and phylogenetic differentiation. These natural technicities are instances of what I'm calling Gaian techniques. Throughout Gaian regimes, even when specific biota are aggregated sympoietically with their symbiotic fellows, autopoietic processes continue to operate across cognitive boundaries that simultaneously divide and connect them to the externalized, hence environmental affordances produced by their very aggregation. So to finish up, natural technicities look like the original sampling technology. Their primary productions are new biological phenotypes and fortuitous but functional sympoietic congregations along with diverse ecological accommodations. Now in 2000, as we saw in the clip, Margulis used a once trendy technological figure of modems and hard drives to suggest an image of symbiogenesis as the viable production of new life forms from the supplementary coupling of foreign genomes, often with entire cellular systems into the symbiogenetic bargain as in the lichen. And as we saw in lichens and in mycelial networks, the holobiont subsumes its symbionts without dispersing, but rather by repurposing their specific integrities as operational units. So in sum, concepts of sympoiesis, like those of its engendering processes, symbiosis and autopoiesis, are grounded both of, are grounded both in the molecular operations of living organisms and in the mechanics of aggregation or natural technicities that emerge from evolving life's self involution. Thanks. Very much. If I'm doing a big deal, I think we can push it off every 
The giant metal town that used to be built John were placed along that highway in 2005 as part of the Rotterdam Biennale the Vatican. And they were a celebration of the older landscape and also the role of humans and animals in its making. When we look at them for today, they may also well symbolize the oversized character of the Dutch day industry and also how it's at the end of the is on the version version as a family. After the end of the European uh, milk waters, uh, the country saw a growth of, um, in the amount of farms and also in the amount of cows on the, on the fields. Logically, more cows means more manure. And actually, Dutch cattle produce practically 80% of the manure for farm animals in this country. And as a result, the emissions of ammonia and phosphates has also increased. The amount of the position of nitrogen or natural areas is way beyond European directives. And for that reason, as you know, the, the government has is forced to take action without much access and also creating lots of political and social unrest. Overall, the country is deadlocked. Uh, not many housing projects or infrastructure projects can be built unless the uh, so called nitrogen crisis can be solved. So, from being uh, the poster child of the kind of charismatic species on the Dutch border, the cow is now at the center of all debates and is pointed as a culprit in the crisis. In the past, there are elections, but is in the center left have proposed to reduce the amount of cows from about 15 to 75 percent in the case of the animal practice. Of course, what is meant by the act of reducing the population of cows is not very well known in terms of the process and timing, and less in terms of the ethical implications. When studying on this landscape, the, the day master of the Netherlands, this picturesque natural uh, look is broken when we cannot get closer and see uh, the colors on the couch. Uh, these colors don't hold bells as we are used to, but they hold high tech devices. Uh, they tell us that these cows and these landscapes are more than nature. They are organic chemical hybrids with lots of stories behind that we have to take seriously. So my project, which is funded by a Dutch uh, science organization, NWO, aims to critically engage examine the entanglement of design and technocentric systems in animal life in the industry. And by embracing that complexity to descend the debate away from the cow. The color indicates embeds the cow within a larger cyber-physical system of robots, sensors, digital platforms, and buildings. It geolocates the cow and measures activity, its eating time, combination, temperature, and then passes the information to robots so the algorithms can uh, take appropriate action. For example, they can decide whether a cow is going to go into a little robot and open the fences, or if the, if the let's say, by correlating temperature with activity, Notice something is off, therefore the cow can be sick, it moves it to a, a special zone, which is the barn. And the data then is accessible uh, to the farmer on a smartphone app, so the, the farmer can control remotely what's going on in the farm. Uh, well, the company develops these technologies as advises farmers on how to build the ideal barn for robotic mating, together with suggestions on the location of the digital robots, the fastest ways, the fed automated fences, it also advises the questions of welfare and animal well being. In that barn, uh, the cow's so called five freedoms can be achieved. These are freedom from hunger, from discomfort, from pain, from stress, and freedom to express their natural behavior. <laughs> uh, according to this company, Levy, the one who produces machines, robotization limits a stressful human animal interactions and supposedly makes for the barn an emancipatory space for cows. As a result, the building type has changed. It's not a barn anymore, but a cow lounge. Yeah. <laughs> That's the commercial name. The same session idea uh, reaches the design of the cow itself. Every number of years, the Holstein Association in the US releases the 
ideal or true type cow. This ideal defines the qualities of about 90 physical traits that all breeders should aspire to achieve in their work. While the true type is actually an oil painting, which is painted by this artist called Molly Moore, uh, it really, uh, behind it, there's a whole industry of genomics, marketplaces, and reproductive cells, and competitions. And it's sort of like a trans animalist race for purity and transcendence that is imposed on the species. And actually, never a cow has achieved that idea. The ideal cow of, of today uh, must not be just uh, full of dairiness and femininity. These are words that are used by the Jewish jurors of the competitions. But it has to be also robot ready. And that readiness is uh, related to design uh, physiological characteristics. So, for example, the speed of milking, how fast the milk can be extracted from the cow. But also about behavior, how well the cow is well productive in the box with milking robots. And also the position and size of the mothers and the teeth of the cow. And for now, it seems that the robot ready cows must be smaller and have shorter teeth. All in all, what interests me is how the design of the cow, the robots, technology, buildings, and landscape are coupled, are connected to facilitate the reproduction of the dairy industry. As ecologists discourse and uh, so sustainability discourse is calling for the cleaning of a harmful industrial species, as the dairy cow, projects for rewilding are bringing to that protected nature uh, extinct feral cattle, which actually is the result of genetic crossbreeding as well, exposing that great divide between what comes as nature and culture, and also what is worthy or unworthy to live. Of course, we all probably agree with this uh, room. And it's very easy to say that the factory farmer, farming has to be undone, has to be transformed. Um, but um, in technology, science, economy, the also the productive order that's behind it, which I didn't get into that. But how to do it with accountability and respect to all the species in the world? Probably you won't be out shrinking the cows, the farmer in the cartoon has done. But we also have to be creative and find ways of uh, what could be these new stories on the countryside. As I'm doing this research, which is basically just started, I find myself lost sometimes, so kind of trapped in the map of the other sheep in the cows, and uh, trying to follow the threats of his design, the motivations, the implications of what they mean, how to think with them, and then how to tell the story. So, the question I bring forward to with you all and for the discussion is what forms of engagement with dairy farming, with its histories, science, and politics, animals, and peoples? We be needed to become worldly and participate in the search for more livable other worlds inside this muddy complexity. Thank you. That's this one is on, I think. No. Hi. Got it. Yeah, nice. Okay. Um, positioning implies responsibility for our enabling practices. This sentence from situated knowledges points to what we are up against in architecture, a lack of responsibility for the conditions that enable us to practice architecture. Why are architects, or at least the ones that we live with, love, work with, podcast with, talk with, not willing to understand theirs as a situated practice? It's this provocative question that we want to start with today to talk about conditions for architecture, which is itself, as we've already seen, also, of course, a condition setting practice. Conditions for conditions for conditions for conditions. We position architecture in the everyday and almost banal reality of architectural work, calling suppliers, relating to builders, sitting behind the screen drawing, designing ideas that are hard to execute, making booklets, trying to convince clients. 
This reality of work is often overlooked. But in this time of urgency, we also believe that connecting with these enabling conditions of architecture will help to orient us away from the destructive master subject, away from the gold trick, and into caring and situated practices that enable all living beings to respond to their environments. So, I'm Marina. I'm Catherine. And today is the sort of, uh, we're doing this performative version of an ongoing conversation at this intersection of our specific situatedness. I'm originally from Brazil. I have many interests, they change a lot, but at this point, I've been trying to understand how looking at technologies, philosophy of technology, decolonial theory, cosmotechnics, cosmopolitics, can widen the understanding of this field of architectural production studies. Um, I'm from the Netherlands, and I met Alina uh, many years ago here in Delft during our architecture studies. And I'm also finishing my PhD on democratic infrastructures, where I am combine engaged and empirical work with political theory. And we often come back to this question of conditions in our conversations as friends, co-conspirators, but also colleagues at the International Architecture Biennale de Rotterdam, where we're working on the theme of nature or hope. Uh, seemed by Rosie Bredotti at another moment, the end of modernist hope. Mm -hmm. um, the Biennale starts from a double diagnosis. At a time when bio, social, and technological diversity is threatened, spatial designers have a key role to play in imagining and establishing the conditions for change. But architectural practice is also often complicit in and even reliant on exploitation, extraction, and the suppression of difference. In the Biennale, we therefore rehearse what we're calling an emerging new grief for architecture. The discipline, as we all know, is in the middle of transitioning rapidly into so-called sustainable building. But we take this moment also as a hopeful moment to truly transform our modes of working towards thinking and acting ecologically, sympathetically, forming relations with all kinds of beings and materials. Oops. Um, the urgency for, again, so-called regenerative, non-extractive design is leading to newfound value in the relations with and knowledge of builders, producers, or farmers like, of materials like hemp flex. But we want to highlight that practicing architecture always already involves establishing what conditions will make it possible. There is a fundamental interdependence of architects on other experiences and knowledges not just in so-called nature-inclusive design, but in all design. But it's also this interdependence of architects on their material and social entanglements that is generally dismissed. Conditions for practicing architecture, the materials, builders, and users that make it possible, are treated somewhat evasively, as if they're always external to the practice, not really about architecture proper with a capital A. Architects are used to thinking of themselves as setting conditions, but simultaneously disavow their own dependence on specific conditions. In the architecture universe, there's a huge fear to talk about process and the very often problematic conditions of architectural practice. The act of designing makes architects as much as they make it. They, we, become with their, our architectural objects. The technology is applied in its realization and all of the workers involved in the process. How do we get out of a self-identical alienated position? What infrastructures do we need for becoming together with the work, the material in yeah, aware terms? The work of Japanese Brazilian architect Mayumi Watanabe de Souza Lima in Sao Paulo shows us a deeply ecological and symbiotic mode of understanding and practicing architecture. It is sparsely documented, perhaps because her focus on process and production makes it less attractive within the usual mode of presenting architecture. Um, yeah, coincidentally, I was part of a group that documented her work <laughs> and made these video images of one of her projects in 2016 while I was still living in Brazil. Between 1990 and 1992, 
Mayumi coordinated what was called the SEDEC, the Center for the Development of Urban and Community Facilities, which realized health and community centers, public playgrounds, and also seven schools, of which you uh, see one here behind us. What's really interesting about this project is that it created this entire sort of infrastructural ecology um, for creating these centers, which all branched out from its original construction material. So this construction system that was originally designed by another architect called Jean Figueres Lima included building elements based on the worker's body. So it's light enough that it, that it can be carried for, by maximum two people without sort of overstressing or uh, spending too much energy. The SEDEC program understood that architects not only set, but also need conditions, and was aware that the design and building process also creates conditions for builders, architects themselves, and users. The design and construction process in this way became a site of learning and of solidarity, both in the factory, where um, the architecture and design team provided uh, leaflets and gazettes uh, with the workers to encourage the workers to unionize, but also for the users of the building with neighborhood programming, education programs, and graphic design uh, to inform and engage the neighborhoods of these projects. Yeah. So, all very nice, very good, but then the project was shut down after two years when a new city government took office. So the conditions for this project that itself created so many conditions fell away. How to respond? Should we understand this as an undermining for the conditions for life, as a destruction of habitats? Or should we understand it as a political change, the creation of simply other conditions for coming together that just did not involve this project? In other words, what happens when the conditions for the conditions fall away? How to create the conditions for the conditions? <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today's contribution I'm presenting you, based in a good shifting perspectives in an unsolvable labyrinth, is part of the ongoing PhD research in urbanism, Natura Humana, deconstructing restoration projects in wet environments. I am conducting at Universita U of Di Venezia. Um, the research focuses on the limits, the contradictions, and the paradoxes of Western practices of nature restoration. To do so, the research employs the watery, amphibious, fluid landscape of the Venice Lagoon as litmus test, the best, worst case, in, case study. In fact, while coastal wetlands are globally recognized to play the most crucial role in the current climate crisis, their surface continues to decline. To tackle such raging disappearance, numerous projects aiming at the restoration of nature have been de developed worldwide in the last few decades. However, such projects have proven their fallibility when confronted with outdated lexicons, vulnerable binary conceptual frameworks, and outmoded engineered technologies. In this sense, Venice and her lagoon follows the drift. A hyper-managed hydraulic beast, the humanity seems too afraid to lose, but whose geographies represent the glory field for continuous contradictory operations by those who administrate it. To prompt inventive relation and expand the field of action for lagoon-based restorative practices, it appears then necessary to critically deconstruct and creatively recombine and reassemble the way the Venice Lagoon has been conventionally thought and designed, um, while learning from her historically silenced local ecologies. Trying to abandon a consolidated machist and machinic understanding, the research looks at the Venice Lagoon from a hyper feminist perspective, making space a given and giving voice to census micro stories and hopeful practices of caring, listening, and welcoming. By shifting space, time, and design perspectives, 
the research aims to advance in a movie description towards a more comprehensive and continuous understanding of a city in a landscape. Especially, the Venice Lagoon must be acknowledged as a symbiotic complex living system beyond the dichotomic diatribe on the exclusive survival and protection of either the city, of Venice, of course, or the Lagoon. I'm trying to stay away from Venice's phrase of exceptionalism, but rather embrace the acute curiosity that Venice in the Lagoon might generate. Temporarily, by learning to be truly present, a renovated attention must be dedicated to the present time, the most forgotten temporal dimension of the Venice Lagoon, beyond the glorious past of her legendary Republic of Merchants and Travelers, and potential catastrophic futures below mean sea levels, as predicted by the hierarchs of the IPCC. This indeed resonate as heritages and challenges, but they have numbed our effective power of action. Finally, from a design perspective, the emerging spider web of Design with Nature micro-pilot projects tests a new ground for regenerative landscape designs beyond emergency laws and engineering mega infrastructures as consolidated methods of intervening in the landscape. In a more attuned way, the organic and relational assemblage performing as Venice in a Lagoon expands and sharpens the territorial description beyond the existing confining dichotomies. It invades and loosens the tight knots of complexity instead of simplifying and reducing the reality of things. The research looks for untraced routes and possibilities yet to be explored to put together a needed third story. At the same time, it peeks into the folds and the hidden cracks of disregarded landscapes, experimenting with more than human relations along the margins. There, the Barene, the brackish marshes, offer the accurate field of exploration to advance such a record, and their agency represents the ignition point to rethink the Lagoon landscape. Barene are, inter are intertidal clumps of succulent holophyte plants consolidating thick spongy clay soils. Especially during the long century of modernity, marshes have dropped in surface, compromising their vital role. Therefore, thinking with Venice in a Lagoon elaborates both physical loss and incessant, elaborates both physical loss, the incessant soil erosion the Lagoon has witnessed during the long century, and the symbolic loss, the sense of removal and estrangement and forgetfulness connected to the disappearance of the marshes. The process of recharacterizing the lagoon suggested looking at the borders of ordinary narratives while inevitably broadening perspectives, showcasing the relevance of the marshes. In turn, the study of the marshes landscape pushed the imperative necessity to reframe the surrounding context so that this would mirror their sustaining role and the socio-ecological importance. <laughs> In this perspective, European Union funded projects for nature and biodiversity, while representing conventional and controversial top-down systemic and often not too successful case studies, offer a fertile field for discovery and surprise. Such projects are examined and scanned to understand if probably unconsciously are carrying along traces of caring for each other's survival, even following their hard neoliberal logics. How can micro traces of symbiosis continuously emerging from the cracks of conventional practices can be turned into the primary purpose of mainstream design how can we create the conditions, again, something good company, <laughs> for unexpected, hopeful environmental stories to mindfully proliferate? Such questions lead my understanding of the importance of creating the conditions for unexpectedness to happen, away from romanticization, nostalgia, and praise of the small vernacular at all costs. The proposed contribution contests the utter obsolescence of comfortable suppositions and tries to alleviate a well-grounded allergy to complexity, which at this stage of converging crisis 
has become unforgivable. By doing so, it recognizes the importance of marginal, neglected, and silenced leadings, praise of the Western internal hierarchies of value, repositioning them at the core of the agenda. The research employs them to foster necessary and urgent redescriptions. In the back, Venice in El Amun, free from the conflicting human borders, is represented by the only means of her morphological contour and mathematic lines, suspending attributions as land, water, dry, or wet. In the forefront, humans and more than humans relations are acknowledged by their indissoluble entanglement by inverting conventional points of observation. The turbid underwater world of the lagoon becomes then the vantage point to advance proposition of how to live love, design, and die, die well on and with this planet. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, Thank you for having me. Thank you for um, the wonderful opportunity here. Um, so uh, my name is Had. I'm a I'm a PhD here at this department in the philosophy and theory group. Um, so I've learned a lot from my um, supervisor and and just everyone in the group. Um, uh, my research is is about um, um, constructing a genealogy through water. Um, from a Belizean perspective. Um, and today I will actually just focus on a specific hinge within my research. And um, so previous previous parts or early parts in the in the um, thesis actually focus on, on lichen and it's it's um, it's situated in, in Namibia. Uh, but today I want to kind of um, um, sit at this hinge way trying to introduce the human into into the equation. Um, so, um, I'm, I was born in Namibia, grew up there, but as you can no notice, I'm Caucasian, so I'm part of the, the uh, colonial legacy. So, um, but what makes you new, uh, Namibia unique is that essentially um, the, the three social re regimes coexist, the Nomadic, the Despotic, and the, and the, uh, the Western regime. So, uh, just to uh, look at that a little bit is um, we have hunt gatherers. Um, who are obviously nomadic. Um, and then the dominant um, normative system is, is called Ubuntu, um, to which Rosie uh, alluded earlier, which is a humanist philosophy. And then sort of the, 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 the state, the nation state, and um, capitalism and so on are obviously imported. And we can't, obviously, can't do these things, but they, they intersect. Um, and where I'm, what I'm focusing on here in this particular excerpt is to really try and delve into the worldview of the of the nomadic regime, into the worldview of the, the Sun people. Um, and the reason for that is that unlike the other two social regimes, um, it, it is symbiotic with other species and with the environment, right? Um, and, and in this particular section, I will look at, uh, I will discuss rock art in a particular location, um, and this is um, this is kind of the first uh, exosomatic organ, right? Um, and that's why I'm looking at it. So it's 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 a, a way of externalizing knowledge and and co-constructing the world. Um, so and um, I want to kind of contrast contrast two um, um, theories that coexist within the archaeological anthropological uh, debate. I'm not picking any sides here, um, but what I can say is that um, sort of, and, and also I think there's a, a, a question about the naming of this. So um, the one, the first is called the materialist hypothesis, which I think is a misnomer because um, it's sort of the, the, the stuff that you see at the top there, um, and it really deals with the sites and um, the proximity to rock art, um, the scale of the rock art, and so on. Um, and I really there's something attractive to, about it um, as an architect, as a pragmatist in that sense, um, because this this um, mountain that I look at is sort of an Inselberg in the middle of the 
flat desert plains, it rises to two and a half thousand meters. But the rock art concentrations, there are about a thousand rock art sites, some of them ranging from one grain to others ranging with more than a thousand grains. Um, but they all range within a particular sort of um, altitude, right? 1,800 to 2,100 uh, 2, meters. And within that, they've got all these spatial compositions. And that's, that's um, what the materialist um, hypothesis kind of maps and catalogs. And then um, and their perspective of it is, is kind of looking at the world um, of, you know, I'm, I'm looking at water and how water constructs these worlds. So they look at water as a, a a piece of infrastructure, right? And then that from that um, sort of um, a cosmopolitics emerges. Um, I'm more interested actually sort of from the decolonial perspective in the, the opposite hypothesis, which in that those courses called the idealistic hypothesis, which actually looks at, um, draws on, on cognitive neuropsychology and ethnography as a combination to look at the, the affects of, uh, of trance. Um, um, so some people have a shamanistic tradition and the world, the way that they affect the world is through trance. So, um, and why I think that's interesting is because typically from our perspective, you have this mind-body separation, but here really the body becomes the medium, right? Through which one enters into the spirit realm. And again, the spirit realm is not an abstract, Different realm, but it's a material realm. And that's why I find it really interesting for to look at like early hominids and how they understood the world. And that maybe we can learn something from that that we can then inject into our, um, our own ethics. So just to explain a little bit about that. Um, so you can see that there are all these figures that are, uh, are theoretropic, so shape shifting, right? And that's part of the cosmology where. Um, to be able to affect the world, um, you have to first become the other animal. So this is very delusive in that sense, or you can almost pick up with them directly for it. Um, but there's also this, this notion of the fluid. So if you look at this drawing, you can see that from the nose of the, uh, uh, of the shaman, um, he's bleeding. So there's also a, 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 and, and sweating. So there's this visceral material world, uh, um, um, liquid world, right? And the reason for all of these efforts is that you can then enter into the spirit realm behind the rock face. So the, the rock, the rock part itself is not iconographic, it's actually performative, it's affective, right? And it gets layered over time. And it's part of this, this effort, this affective process, through which one can then you can notice here there's some, some eels here, and you can see how these strings go into the crack of the rock face. And what's really interesting is that um, within that cos cosmotechnical perspective, the world, the spiritual realm, is a liquid world. It's underwater. And that's partly because if you go through trance, the intense um, um, body, visceral bodily effects makes, makes you feel like you're floating, makes you feel like you're out, out of breath underwater. So, so they understand the spiritual realm as physically underwater. And that from that, they can gain either uh, bring healing or bring rain or so on. And I don't know what to make of this. I don't know how to bring this into, into our, our worldview, but I think that there's something about it in the sense that it challenges the mind-body separation, um, the, the separation between cognition and spirit or material and spirit. Um, they're, they're, very, they're very much closer. And I think that especially because you're also shifting from one species to another in that cosmology. I think the other thing that you can learn that I, I can't put my finger on the pulse of what, the, what, what this is exactly, but I think we can learn something from that that will then affect our own ethics, um, particularly when we start critiquing the systems that we have constructed and that we sit in. So um, here are some examples of, of the sites that I've found. There's, some, um, there's a spirit animal up a Gray animal at the top right, at the top left. Um, there's a black crack in the rock there. Um, yeah, and then it just gets to this question of how how can we from from that perspective, from the horizon, from outside, towards the middle. Um, so those are sort of the speculations that I that I want to put out there, and maybe maybe some of you have answers for me. So <laughs> thank you.
That was great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maria or Maria Dolores, however you prefer. And today I'm going to present to you my master's thesis here at Faculty of Architecture that I finished this summer. Um, the FPSD is the journey or the personal journey of unearthing um, the ancestral and anthropomorphic relationships that make up this measure, which is kind of about where the maternal life and family is originating from. And um, this is also the ultimate goal of terrestrial mediation. Um, so I started from the idea that Tierra, um, a little bit different from Gaia, is, um, is a term that connects um, and sort of links beings to the social um, and historical, but also ecological environment. And that fertility is a measure that at the same time uh, limits, but also empowers um, whole buy-in, um, such as human bodies, but also soil itself. And um, the project itself is strung around six ecofeminist figurations um, that you can see here, where each um, figuration represents um, a genealogy of the entanglements around a specific being um, that can be of either fictional or non-fictional origin. Each account holds a very unique experience that illustrates the potential um, of interspecies um, symbiosis and ancestralism that together can create a narrative um, tradition that enables both the storyteller and the listener um, to observe, sorry, to immerse themselves completely into the history of Galerueva. And as I started this project itself um, from sort of ancestral perspective, um, the narrative itself starts, oops, sorry, um, from here, from the mother of the village, Honor de Hatta, and from there, it follows her descendants throughout the ages of um, the colonization of the Americas, of the Spanish Reconquista, or the Catholic Reconquista, but also um, more modern history. And um, the boundaries between these different reparations um, are not strictly defined. And because of that, it's actually the intersections between them that create um, the most interesting friction in the project. And in that friction, you can also sort of, uh, or a cosmology of Galerola comes together. But in the end, they are fundamentally um, my own personal population. And I intend to share them with others and through that um, keep transforming and blending the, the side of tradition and keeping it alive. And through listening, others, such as yourself, um, develop a personal reading. Uh, and in this sense, each figuration is sympoietic and encourages um, the coming with through storytelling. So, for example, the coming with, the coming feral, the coming with Sita, as here, so sort of humanist trans individuation um, through listening, through talking. And uh, also in line with this, this sort of sixth and informal figuration, um, which is represented not on the screen, but by myself. Um, so I sort of um, immerse myself into the project as a chronic witch, um, but I also encourage others in this context to also embody the witch in them. So together with um, my fellow witches, I'm working on expanding this uh, sort of collective archive um, of oral and tested knowledges of Galerueva. And it is, in a sense, an extended family album that forms the basis of these figurations. And um, the collection, alongside the figurations, um, oh sorry, uh, the collection alongside with the figurations, I mean, sort of can or has the intention of um, serving as inspiration for residents, but also with designers who want to engage with the matter in hand. And uh, as you can see, and I think we talked about archives this morning. It's uh, not a very clean archive. It's a dirty archive. Uh, it's a, uh, there's a lot of earth in there. So um, this also generates a problem because there is such a wealth and diversity of material that um, bringing these different ideas together and understand the connection between them, such as, for example, between a racist uh, comic strip um, of missionaries and, I don't know, and uh, here, the color of lichen, how do these come together? Um, and especially on an ideological level, the politics and personal feelings intercede with the idea of a collective biography and the focus on the matter of Yera or Earth itself. 
So can ideologies be dissected at a microscopic level and be situated in a terrestrial um, cartography? Um, to illustrate this, um, let us dive into the fifth population of the prodigal daughter um, that addresses the wounds created by the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s. And although Teledorf itself was never a battlefield, um, nonetheless, six people were killed in the name of the nationalist Falange, uh, under the rule of Franco, who then became the dictator of Spain. So the interim dictatorship um, sort of sought the erasure of their deaths. Um, or of the deaths of opposite camps of the government um, in a, in a uh, pact of oblivion. And furthermore, it was also Franco that founded the Ministry of Colonization um, that was wholly dedicated to coloni colonizing the countryside, which in Galileva um, resulted in an agricultural cooperative that is based on the communal having shared or communally shared land use. Um, but in the end, it only encourages monoculture and um, is degenerating the um, biodiversity. Um, so basically, we're in this triangle of three different problematics here. So in the chain of events that led from the Civil War to the anthropomorphic disruption of the soil um, through the colonization, as you can see here in this um, very poor soil quality that is generated by the um, cooperative fields. Um, I want to introduce innocence, um, both as an ideological idea and as an actual person. Because innocence is, is as a term, the lack of guilt, um, and it sort of separates dominant from subordinate beings. But innocencia, or innocence, is also the name of a 17-year-old girl who on the 4th of August 13, uh, 1936 was on a walk with a boyfriend over her father's field and was then killed by the Falange because um, they were trying to get revenge on her father who was the mayor. So this is um, in memory to her. And because of the Pact of Oblivion that was later um, dictated by Franco, her story among many others was erased from Spanish history. So let us together picture in the yeah, in her father's field on a very hot August day um, where she becomes one with the critters and the specters, um, with the more than human and this sort of just begun human, um, that were all obliterated together during this time of dictatorship and colonization. So they become one together. And yeah, let us enable her to return to her tierra by remembering her. But to remember her, or in other words, to engage our collective memory to fight oblivion, we have to unearth and unlearn. Um, the matter at hand and dig a bit deeper as well. So I ask you as well, how is Innocencia grounded in the Tierra Fertil, but also how are we all, all of us here, part of the Tierra Fertil? So, hello, uh, my name is uh, Cadena Sabrini, and I will present and talk to you about my uh, early, early stage PhD thesis from the uh, National Technical University of Athens. And it's about uh, transnational networks of dog uh, rescue. And uh, I thought it was, uh, because it's very early stage, it was um, it makes sense to start also with a question. So, uh, my question is very simple. Um, how did you and your dog uh, come to live together? How did you meet? How did you become companions? Uh, these questions were um, served as conversation starters uh, during my dog walk alongs in uh, Athens and Rotterdam, where uh, I have done uh, research and lived, uh, done research on urban dog words and lived for the past uh, few years. So, um, these questions led to, uh, in Athens, they led to stories of exclusions and microaggressions and also the very effective ways that uh, humans and dogs uh, negotiate the city nature boundary on the everyday basis, since the, the role of, of animals in the city is still 
very much contested matter. And uh, in Rotterdam, where we are major uh, cities and uh, to the artificiality of different histories, uh, the, this question is led to the stories of uh, the sensory politics of in neighborhood and gentrification. Uh, significantly, though, what I learned from uh, both these cases, the gentrification of them, is that they are not only um, interesting to think with together, but they are uh, part of uh, their nodes in the same transnational networks of dog love and control. So uh, these networks are comprised of a multitude of uh, organizations and individuals scattered around Europe. They're both formal and informal, they're all the in-between. And uh, they work together to rescue dogs from locations that they are perceived to be in, to endure suffering and abandonment and relocate them to a uh, space that I can still safe. Um, and um, you, can, you could maybe uh, perceive, understand the situation as uh, emerging at an intersection of uh, different processes. So on one hand, uh, accelerate the uh, globalization of our times, and on the other, um, the increasing regulation of Canadian kind of populations in cities, but as well the rise of uh, uh, pet dogs uh, within our homes. So and in Europe specifically, um, this dynamic is a form of transnational dog rescue networks, which relocate dogs from uh, southern and eastern Europe and home them in cities with different north. So uh, when I found out about these networks from these simple questions, uh, I thought that um, the simple question of how did you and your dog come to live together? Uh, I thought that perhaps it is the movement in between the center and the periphery of Europe itself uh, that could be a productive line of flight, uh, one that may lead to a more uh, nuanced understanding of the politics of mobilities uh, through a more than human lens. And so uh, I decided to focus on these transnational flaws and practices with the aim to problematize the concept of rescue by asking. How does the coming together of companion species through rescue practices across city and state borders might enact and reproduce subjects of rescue and influence perhaps the formation of spatial imaginaries in the European context? Yes. So, um, <laughs> this question then led to my uh, PhD research project. Uh, so, I also understand spatial imaginaries. Um, uh, following the uh, said and uh, many other things that uh, rework the, the term as a discursive, discursive material process uh, relation produced that then uh, work to legitimize certain interventions and policies. And so this question has not been posed uh, in a vacuum, uh, but it's embedded uh, in the context of Europe in multiple crisis, a context that has led to the resurgence of deeply rooted and historically produced uh, north south and east west divisions. And it is a context in which I could myself be considered a subject of rescue, meaning in my case, economic reform and financial bailouts. Uh, that perhaps is the reason I want to stay with the trouble of this notion, the notion of, the, of rescue and the subjects it produces. Uh -huh. I forgot that. So um, I approach this question uh, astrographically by tracing the relationships between people, dogs, and their, their environments as they move from uh, rural to urban spaces and from the periphery of Europe to the center. Uh, in particular, I use multi-species ethnographic methods to try and create space for the meaningful uh, interactions between um, the dogs I encounter to be sniffed, licked, touched, and uh, peed on like I, have, I already have and for them to express their individuality and participate in the research as subjective participants rather than objects of human representation. And drawing on uh, feminist epistemologies, which have taught me to examine the reproduction of uh, geopolitical dynamics in seemingly insignificant moments and everyday encounters, I explore how the movement of people and dogs across Europe maps onto, reinforces, or challenges historically produced divisions and imaginaries. In an era in which national identities have gained a renewed potency as a marker of social and special difference and exclusion. So I engage with the uh, production of subjects of rescue as a process 
um, embedded in everyday body encounters between uh, humans and dogs. Uh, encounters like the ones that took place during my dog walk along interviews um, in Rotterdam uh, during which during which um, brother spatial spatial imaginaries uh, seemed to map onto and be negotiated through the dogs the rescued dogs body uh, behavior and sensory perceptions uh, in complex ways and at times when the rescued dogs happen to be of the same origin as myself. I felt our identity categories being shaped in relation to each other, following uh, Harlow Weaver and Don Harlow in it. I understand these interactions as processes of becoming with dogs that mark our bodies as belonging or out of place, vulnerable, threatening, in need of rescue or control, as a form of banal material materialization of powerful histories and geopolitical relations. And so this research project is based on the belief that um, the processes through which canine companions are rescued and rehomed might shed light on subtle and nuanced cartographies of powers through which the subjects and objects of rescue uh, are relationally produced and imprinted on human and non-human bodies. Uh, this project addresses two parallel interventions. Um, uh, in parallel, I'm sorry. So, on the one hand, the infusion of non-human subjects in a predominantly uh, anthropocentric um, conception of space and politics, and uh, on the other hand, to challenge um, uh, to challenge the the um, sorry. Uh, the other imperative is uh, the challenge posed by the rise of nationalism within Europe, uh, which seek to define who and what is considered out of place. Uh, so I consider uh, rescue dogs as significant transnational figurations in my aim to understand how the movement of companion species across Europe might shape historically produced um, spatial imaginaries. And I see the most potential partners in developing an understanding of intersubjective and interstices negotiations of difference and belonging. So the intimate and involved interactions between companion species and their environments provide a crucial entry point into a cartography of the more than human geopolitical mutations that take shape in the context of globalized advanced capitalism in which we find ourselves. Significantly, I argue that understanding rescue um, Rescue dogs as nomadic subjects who form messy, affective relations with the people and environments they encounter as they cross local, urban, and national boundaries might shed light on ongoing processes of becoming subjects in an era in which the capacity to be alive is afforded by the ability to be mobile. And so, concluding this uh, presentation, I would like to also um, to close with a question or a set of questions. Inspired, inspired by both your works, um, in which you always include provocation to um, to infuse both critique and creativity into our figurations. And so the questions are: um, How would we apply? Yes. Uh, how can we apply the simultaneity of critical and creative thinking in the context of the transnational flows of dog rescue in Europe? And how can we rethink the concept of rescue? In the realm of our multi species relations, uh, how might we reimagine new forms of kinship based on care while acknowledging the complex histories of our modern human geopolitics? For example, thank you. Well, I'm just going to join the I want to see more. 
Now that I am properly connected to the communication devices, I'm not altogether natural techniques, uh, where the simple way production of the communicating subject relies on autophoretic cell and of course the natural techniques of the symbiotic uh, relationships and then biogenetic ongoing processes of my body and all of which Bruno taught me to stay in the last few minutes <laughs> uh, but also um i appreciate very much first of all starting with Bruno's uh invocation development elaboration of a natural technique so the extended prosthetics I want to mark the way that is very different from the extended phenotype of the neo-Darwinist like Richard Dawkins. And it's much more the kind of earthy, mighty, dripping, filamentous, symbiogenetic processes of a Margulian, Margulian, I mean, that work, of Margulis is my biology. Uh, it's the kind of biology that I think we actually are and inhabit. But I'd like to know. Uh, one thing that Bruno did not take up in his notion of sympoetics that is very important to me, and I think to Scott Gilbert in the alliance, uh, in the uh, what Angela Davis referred to as this consortium of conflicts and collaboration, these, afford these mutual affordances among Scott, Bruno, and me, and others uh, through the concept of sympoesis, and that is developmental sympoesis. Because I think what's most important to Scott, and I think to me, although I'm a bit in the middle between the two, is that symbolism is especially interesting as a, a way of thinking, uh, not lichens, not cows with their symbionts, not mice with their symbionts that deal with the brain and so on, but these kinds of, of um, kind of se sequential uh, scaffolding through time that produces development and then alters all the participants, but without the kind of integration of a life in, uh, or uh, it's, a kind of, it's a different kind of togetherness and separation than the, than the mergers and co-livings of already formed entities like the alga and the fungus in the lichen, for example. So the developmental symbiosis uh, uh, introduces something else that I think is not quite caught yet. Uh, in the way we've been able to think this so far. Um, now, I want to go to Calborgs in the Holder, which is a title to die for. And I, I thank you for the um, gift of Calborgs in the Holder, which is a very situated kind of cyborg uh, in which the, the necessity to reduce the dairy herd of the Netherlands, can you imagine such a thing? Um, to reduce the dairy herds of the Netherlands by as much as 75% without destroying uh, the farmers of dairy cattle and God knows without restricting the consumption of cheese uh, or milk or restricting the consumption of much of anything near as I can tell. So it's the cows that have to be altered. Once again, the cows have to be the target of re-engineering in order to get the farmers through the day, in order to deal with the methane crisis, in order not to bother the, the Dutch consumers of cheese and milk too much, maybe a little bit. You can have yogurt maybe once a day, not three times a day. So I'm interested in, once again, the cow bears our burdens from the bison and the, you know, from the, the cattle who pull our carts, God knows when. Once again, they become really kinds, uh, a kind of a re instrumentalization, yet once again, of cows, with, of course, an extraordinarily appropriate EU kind of thinking of the five freedoms of the cow, which include normal enough behavior not to bother the regulators too much, but perhaps not normal enough behavior to let the boys and girls live together, for example or even to leave the babies with their mothers for very long, unless their milk production suffers, or, uh, or, 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 or. So that what counts as natural enough behavior has everything to do with manageability of the herd. Good enough. Thank you. Um, so I think I would like to ask um, uh, Victor to comment on the how not good enough and so what 
uh, if the cow board uh, is to be freely moving in the field a little more than under the five pregrams. Uh, now, I want to move to this really interesting dialogue between Elena and Catherine to get architects to recognize the conditions of conditions of conditions of conditions. There's a remarkable kind of recursive looping, call that autopoiesis, kinds of recursive circular causal looping uh, in trying to get architects perhaps to be a bit more autopoetic in their circular causal systems uh, and to really take more account of the specificity of conditions in their productions. And we heard about one very interesting but failed project lasted two years. We're not quite sure why it failed. Neither, I think, are Arena and Catherine too sure that why it failed. So I kind of want to know a little more about that not knowing. And then I'd also like to know if there's some really interesting examples for you of coming together, uh, a kind of, of conditions of coming together and how to create since the failure of the C deck. Um, uh, example that you that you teased us with. Uh, I was all set to be happy, but you didn't give me even two minutes, much less two years, uh, before this particular kind of resituating of architectural self, the, the consciousness of the architects, uh, as that consciousness becomes enfolded in doing architecture with the subjects, uh, with, with the other actors and players. Uh, both human and, and more than human, technical, human, and uh, all of the above. So I'd like to hear some more about um, what kinds of practices now give you, intrigue you, give you a sense of the action you want to be part of. Now then, the Venice and the Lagoon, that's another title I will die for. And then, uh, of course, the, 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 it's, it's uh, pre that the Venetian Lagoon, the Lagoon of Venice, this kind of pre-adaptation for the title. I understand that. Um, but I'm very interested in the way that this water city uh, is approached by you in terms of the marshes and the reestablishing of the salt of the plant of the salt tolerant plants in the brackish marshes uh, as a condition for the ongoing uh, 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 as a uh, as a reparative process, as a kind of partial repair of the blasted lagoon, of a lagoon that has been destroyed through dead dredging, shipping, tourism, God knows what. And you're not super interested in whether Venice towns or not, though there are those who really are kind of interested in that. Um, you are extremely interested uh, in the, uh, partial, in the, rep the partially reparative processes of the restoration of the marshes. Well, so am I. I'm really down with that. And I care about the salt tolerant plants more than I care about the giant tourist ships in the in the in the Venice Lagoon, get rid of them uh, and get those marsh plants back. That's easy. But I think what I want to ask in relation to this really beautiful uh, thinking that we got is how the Venice Lagoon and its uh, these processes of restoring the, the mar restoring the brackish marshes uh, is like and not like what's going on in New Orleans in cities in Bangladesh, in cities in Southeast Asia. What about the partial restorations of the mangrove forests in the face of ongoing palm oil plantations up the river? Um, how, uh, how do we think a little bit cosmopolitically about these lagoon cities, all of whom are threatened, both by the uh, direct destruction of habitat um, the, the direct dredging, the direct wiping out of the barrier islands, so on, so on, by sea level rise, all of the above. Are there networks? Uh, there must be networks of colleagues in, in rich communication with each other uh, about the situated specificity as well as the shared um, uh, conditions of these, of these water cities. Because these water cities have been important in world history for an extremely long time, and they're not going to stop being important. And their people, and more than people, are directly vulnerable. So I'm really interested in hearing something about the cosmopolitics of the Venice Lagoon in my day. And then we get to the rhizomatic genealogy of the political ecology in Namibia as done through rock art, uh, which I think is a fabulous way to approach the questions of water. Uh, and I'm really interested in the little factoid that you told us about the, the fact that the, the rock art exists in this band, this, this kind of band of death. 
Uh, and I, I'm curious to know more about that. Uh, and the, the talk was especially interested in the, 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 trans, the uh, transformational um, uh, morphing, intermorphing between what Westerners call the spiritual world and the material world. It's not called that at all, I'm sure, uh, by the uh, Balem uh, people in Namibia. I'm not sure how to say that. Um, but the materiality of trance, the problem with the word materiality and all of this, but nonetheless, the way the, the um, transformations between uh, what we call human and animal, between trans states and normal states, supposedly, uh, the kind of work that does to bring those who are part of that performance into a water world that might in turn bring water out into a world that is extremely dry, that might be a source of moisture and a flaking of a thirst of the lamb. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, extremely interested in those processes. And I want to know how you know it. Who's teaching you? Then how are we? Uh, and why should I trust your reading of the rock art? Who are your teachers? Uh, are those teachers themselves competent interpreters of the rock art? If so, how so? And within which, lang which languages does this teaching occur? And how does that affect the bringing of moisture out into the world that is so needy of moisture? So I'd like to know some more about that, if I may, please. All these papers, by the way, are truly really fabulous, and they provoke my curiosity. Then we are in Tierra del Fuego, and I think we're in Spain, although I didn't explicitly learn that. It just had to be. I think I learned that when we were talking about the Spanish Civil War, uh, which is absolutely the time to learn it, I think. But I would have liked being situated more robustly from the get-go so that I had a way of thinking of the, the genealogy, genealogizing of collective futures through this uh, particular kind of, of uh, tierra. Uh, tierra doesn't translate into English. Um, in, uh, it, it can be translated as earth or world or soil or land or all of the above or none of the above. But Tierra has a special kind of resonance. And Tierra Feltier has a special kind of resonance that I think his paper brought out for us uh, in particularly powerful ways. And the way that, th that this land has been subject to violence, colonization of the countryside uh, in, in the period of fascist Spain, uh, the impact of oblivion, which extends to recent murder of yet another young woman on this very land, and the monumentalization, the memorialization of it, uh, which is perhaps even a, a, a further part of the process of making, making absent, of, of not remembering. I don't know. I'm not quite sure the degree to which um, the, uh, the, mem the memorialization, I'm not, I don't know what work it does, what I'm saying. But you did two really interesting, two interesting kinds of things that you bring up. Figures with a kind of sequence from the miraculous mother through a couple of others onto the mestiza goddess, onto the prodigal daughter. Uh, and the prodigal daughter is, uh, I think, carries the most weight in the talk. It was maybe the most interesting figuration for Tierra de Martil. And I'd like to know more about why, how that sequence of figurations ties more, uh, a little more robustly with Tierra Verde. Um, and then you also have the archive of the Calaruca. Um, and so the, the play between the figures and the archives intrigues me. And again, I think what, what you provoked me to is, is the kind of curiosity that keeps saying more, 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 more. Uh, can you get me into the, the weeds? Can you get me more into the details? Of where we are and how it works and the, uh, the play of the figures and the archives in this particular place. Are we, by the way, in Pantaloon? I don't know where in Spain we are. Uh, no, it's Castilla. In no, where? Castilla is old Spain. Okay, it's in Castilla. Okay, this is really important. Uh, <laughs> I keep trying to figure it out. Uh, and, and so I want to know how it matters that we're there and not in Catalan, where I thought we might be because of the particular way you were both the Spanish Civil War, but I was wrong. Okay. Um, so, really, really good stuff. Then we get 
finally to dogs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and we get to dogs. Mind you, my current dog, Shin and Chu, which is bad men Mandarin taking from taken from Ursula with the Gwyn's novella, Paradise is Lost, an intergenerational spaceship, the original Mandarin speakers, four generations out, are pointing that the Tierra Nova Nuova, uh, they're calling it Shinichu. New Earth, new land, uh, uh, that to which we are tending. Bad Mandarin, my dog is named in Bad Mandarin, uh, Shindichu. Well, not bad, bad Mandarin, it's four, four generations out. Because she arrived in the belly of an airplane from Taipei to San Francisco in an international dog rescue operation in a period of time when I had decided not to buy another purebred dog. Well, I asked you, is innocence available in this story? The answer is no. Um, so this international transfer, so quickly is subject making. Subject making for my Shinjitsu, subject making for me, the, the, the practice of, of bonding uh, in this place is absolutely about place making and about, uh, for me, and I think in ways that you, you describe this a little bit, um, the, the being with Shindichu, the coming with Shindichu, provokes a curiosity about Taiwan that has made me a kind of an instant expert. That is to say, don't trust the word I say, but I think I actually know something about the non-Han Aboriginal peoples for whom the Formosa mountain dogs are incredibly important. I think I know something about the thousand years ago when that particular kind of dog was moved from the coast of what we now call, call Southeast China into what we now call Taiwan. I think I know something about the dispersion of these dogs and their relationship with the non-Han peoples. I know something about how the Japanese tried to exterminate them. I think I know something about how they become the major contributors to, contributors to the large street dog population of Taipei and to the lack of respect for the street dogs of Taipei and the necessity of respect for street dogs. Thank you. So part of the uh, part of the elaboration of this rescue ideology, taking the dogs from these places of abjection, the abject subject of the not quite good enough nation in a condition of perpetual suffering, even if they're leading quite competent dog lives on the street, thank you. And yes, their death rate is high, especially among the young dogs, Puppy survival rate is not high. There are many things to say about street dogs, especially in situations where people are dumping their dogs as opposed to sterilizing them. There's a lot to say about the kind of problems street dogs have to deal with. But a discourse of the competence of street dogs is long overdue. And why exactly do they need rescue? Well, I know why my Shindichu needed rescue. It's because she was actually starving. I have a picture of her at about five months when she and her litter mate are picked up uh, and brought into the chair. Fascinating businesswoman, uh, Kyrie's Chinese woman who runs this international deal really well and really takes care of the dogs and the people and all the rest of it. But kind of nobody but me in that group questions the ideology of rescue. Uh, and so I really appreciate the way you brought Athens and Rotterdam ethnographically to our attention through walking and talking with the dogs and their people, walking and talking and communicating with the dogs and their people on the streets of Rotterdam that is about the transposition from the inadequate European state of Athens. We all know that Athens is in debt, inadequate, a little dirty down there south, almost communist, and that their dogs need rescue en masse, if possible, to Northern Europe. <laughs> okay. And sure enough, there's a bunch of them here, properly rescued in what in the United States we call forever homes. God, talk about the heterosexualization of all that. <laughs> and the normalization of a kind of cross species regrowth activity through the rescue from the dirty to the clean, the south to the north, and then the end of the yeah. You realize there's an exportation of dogs in the United States. From dirty southern states like Alabama, the clean northern places like California, because they don't take care of their dogs and we give them forever homes. You don't have to go to Taipei. Then there's that fabulous set of stories around Puerto Rico. The United okay, Boston, for example, doesn't have enough dogs at the right size, kind of 25 to 50 pounds. 
uh, because they sterilize all their dogs with, that might produce dogs like that, and their shelters run out of dogs like that super, super, super fast. They're adopted, adopted they're cute, they're the right size. They're adopted in an eye blink. So dogs of that size could be imported to supply the market of the adoption, the adoption market, et cetera. So I particularly appreciated the way you get at worlding and cosmopolitics and structures and equality and nation building and subject building, all the rest of it. And I dare you to think I shouldn't have championship. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go search my leg. I apologize for not making you eye contact with the arm. Thank you, Dr. Lickmans, and uh, your excitement. Uh, um, I would never say that we have to stop the, the rescue. No, I didn't. Oh, <laughs> yes. uh, uh, yeah, you very wonderfully described the, the complexities and conflicts and ambiguity of this practice. And I guess every practice of relationality finds ourselves with humans and more than humans. And, I got the creature, creature uh, in this world. And um, yeah, and that's it for now. You had a dog. No. Oh, special for my internals. Is that because you're a student or because you're just a so not anyway? Honestly, uh, because, <laughs> uh, because I'm a student, I don't have stability in my life. And um, also because recently I lost a relative, like someone close, and I don't think I can handle being responsible for someone's life. And have a good moment. Yeah, got it. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Um, so the first question relates to the innovations. Um, kind of like okay. Um, I kind of like to think about the mountain kind of like a city, um, because it, it's like 25,000, uh, it's 50,000 squares, uh, 50,000 square kilometers, so it's about, um, you know, it's quite big. Um, um, and then the reason for the elevation at which people kind of lived or um, is partly to do with uh, it's a granite mountain, uh, mountain, right? So everything else is um, quite flat around it, and it was fought through glaciation processes, which took away all the other strata and was pushed up. So it's been linked. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like. Um, um, is it uh, the, 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 what was used to be called A's rock in, in Australia? It's kind of similar to that. So it's it's um, this flat landscape and then this high mountain. And um, um, so that that pushes um, um, clap. Hold down. Yeah. Right now, Hold the mic. Wow. Well, I, I. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. So it has to do with the fact that um, at certain places it's too steep, um, and then you have the, the mountain itself holds water, right? So because because it pushes air up. Um, so the rest of the desert is dependent on fog. So it's the only fog dependent desert. Um, so in the earlier chapters, I kind of write about fog fostering beetles and lichen and that kind of thing. And, and here is kind of the first place where it 
uh, manifest as like human habitation. Um, and what makes it unique, so, so those are the elevations which are sort of in the valleys on top of the, on top of the mountain. Um, and the, the, the biology is completely different from down on the plain, right? So the plains are really desert. And whereas um, on top of the mountain, it's much more like um, um, center, central areas of the, of the country. So it's um, bushy, shrubby, um, and so on. Um, so that's the main reason why people live there, um, or they use it kind of as a base. Um, then um, there was a question around the labor um, or, or work in terms of the trance. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's exactly how I read it as well. Is that you have to actually do the physical labor to the world, and you have and and the 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 theanthropic uh, move, the the, the the changing into the animal is is sort of the <laughs> it's your yeah. bioelectric potential. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so um, it's a it's a dead crime transaction. So um, even in hunting, uh, when the sun have killed uh, uh, an antelope, they will sit with the antelope first, um, explaining why they had to kill it as to a source of food and so on. So there's a, there's a very strong um, reciprocal relationship between themselves and and um, other species. And then uh, in terms of who the, the main proponents of the theories are, um, so so most of the work, most of the rock art was documented, documented by a team uh, from University of Cologne uh, under a, a, a gentleman or a scholar called Lenz Ernst. Um, and they have a very analytical way of doing it, right? So um, uh, they acknowledge the shamanistic tradition, um, but they they really try and stay away from interpreting it, and they really just catalog things based on proximities, and then then they start saying so there are six categories, and then three of the categories are have some spiritual meaning, but they really take it from a very secular perspective. Um, um, when did they do that work? Um, so it, it, it's still ongoing, um, but it started in actually in the seventies. So it started with photography and then tracing the stuff, the, the things, and now they're kind of cataloging everything. The, the, the other school, um, uh, which is the idealistic school, so called, um, uh, emerged sort of in the early 80s uh, from, from the University of the Bundesland um, in Johannesburg uh, under David Lewis Williams. Um, and they really look at um, speaking to communities using ethnographic. Um, references um, and how they interpret the drawing. Because prior to uh, sort of the acknowledgement that it was uh, shamanistic, um, it was reduced to being just um, mundane depictions of uh, everyday life. Um, and and um, incidentally, you see sort of that Eurocentric perspective as well in the, the cover image of, of, of the figure is called the White Lady. Um, Whereas we know we now acknowledge that it's a, a shaman, but um, early in the rock art studies, they they trying to say, oh, it's a Mino Minoan white woman or a Christian woman that was visiting, and sort of you see those sort of colonial legacies very through the rock art. So, so I think that's why uh, the the sort of uh, what they call the idealistic perspective needs to be taken seriously and then speak to people about reconstructing that world and then understanding what we actually do and how, how do we change our own system. So, Scott, do you have a question? Mike, this um, Yeah, I think I, I really engage with your questions in the sense that uh, even though like Venice uh, as a city might sound quite uh, quite provincial when you live in it, but then when you perceive it from outside, it looks and it seems extremely um, cosmopolitical and international. Um, I have two, let's say, connections with what you asked me, because one relates to the origin of the, the wording that I've used. So Venice Lagoon is not something that I've invented, but I give credit to the work of landscape architects Andrew Adamapur and Dilip Dakuna, who based between India and uh, uh, the US have rephrased and rethought the city of Mumbai 
in a, in an estuary, so as a as, as a continuum, no. And I thought that already thinking or rephrasing the thinking, uh, while we are uh, often too much connected and uh, also numbed, I would say to uh, yeah, to, to formal structures, uh, would have been also a, a quite mm, let's say interesting exercise because it's an exercise um, to. Yeah, to, to take and to bring it in, no, to yeah, to test what have what have been conventionally the thinking related to the entity of the city of Venice. So for me, that rephrasing of a city in a continuous processual landscape uh, subjugated to uh, the, the the power of the hydrological cycle with the monsoon and with uh, this extremely, you know. The almost totalizing uh, uh, atmospheric conditions that it has Mumbai, for example, I thought it would have been, you know, triggering for the conventional thinking related to the city of Venice and to the lagoon and this, you know, binary thinking uh, that it would have been interesting. And on the other side, then I realized that paradoxically, uh, one of the most prominent community in the in Venice, not located in the islands but in the inland. Is the one of the Bangladesh people that really, uh, unfortunately, they left uh, a flood-prone, uh, disastrous uh, delta, and they fled to another one. Uh, that worse. yeah, exactly. And so also that reminds me constantly that it's not just uh, us confronting with uh, an isolated or peculiar condition, but then we share. Uh, a common, uh, yeah, a common living, and also that I, I am extremely fascinated by that because maybe there is some kind of a, un unconscious connection, you know, that brought people that left the delta within another one, and where they could also comfortably live with the condition that they knew from from the place they they yeah they they fled. So I don't I don't know about that, but that plus U.S. funded migration through the Pakistani. Uh, apparatus at that time that drove people out. Yeah, the, the unconscious connection took the form. Yeah, exactly. To re replicating known conditions, no, of uh, replicating known conditions, but forced forced exodus. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Like U.S. funded forced exodus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, in any order. <laughs> well, what about freedom and behavior? Keep on trying. I think that sometimes when the balls are on, there's a uh, uh, signal. I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, what is interesting is how the, the, this. Uh, <laughs> Both of them. The falls of the car. Um, yeah, I mean the, the, the promise of, of the Bangladesh model is is that the cow is able to fulfill those freedoms that were put forward by the uh, UK uh, Council for Animal Welfare. <laughs> That. But uh, that freedom is sort of uh, questionable in the sense that the, it is the system who decides when the cow can be free or not. So if the cow is eating well and that is well behaved, then it can go into the robot. Yes. The robot. And above all, not afraid. Yes. I think that's so, but that's genetically great and all that's maybe on the, on the cow. So that talks about the natural behavior of the robot. Yeah. And, and the idea is that this, uh, with this freedom for the cow to be able to, to, to decide when it wants to go into the working robot, and therefore the, the going to the working robot system that told him to go outside to, to graze, uh, is that uh, 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 there are too many cows inside. So that creates, of course, problems. And uh, uh, there is now the, 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 the way that the, uh, all these technology companies are trying to address the, the nitrogen problem, which is to put the wrong new solution. What kind? So, for example, there are two that are separate, but they are connected. So, one of them is in which basically 
they are a separate a way to separate the flows of urine urine and uh, feces so that there is no production of, of, of chemicals so basically these are the cows have to be inside all the time because then they yeah, because uh, otherwise you can't otherwise separate you can it. and then the the the, the, the results of that is they use a fertilizer so you can fertilize the lungs and the other correct is that with that you cannot have naturally grass fed grass fed cows so that you cannot brand your milk as grass fed cows but the what they have developed is an automated vehicle that mows the fields the line and bridge the fresh grass to the cows inside so the, the robot is replacing the race the race of the fields yeah, so it's kind of accumulation of solutions. How frequently are these cows made pregnant? Basically, the, every year, the, every cycle, the, and they're killed at about what the, four years, five years. Yeah, it depends on. The so process. when their pregnancy stop being, that's right. Stop that's right. being as productive, et, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So as a sort of a reproductive freedom and autonomy feminist, I identify with the cow work uh, in her forced pregnancies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> At it. <laughs> what we won't do, I mean, there's nothing we won't do um, to um, we collectively, uh, these techno capitalist systems, the, these uh, extremely interesting techno capitalist systems of, of just enough welfare, just enough fear reduction in a prey species, just enough freedom to be behaviorally not totally local. Not completely crazy, not going crazy. Just just good enough not to be putting out the adrenal cortical uh, uh, steroids that show extreme stress. What are the boundaries of just enough to extract just enough ongoing profit? Well, cows are a fabulous place to look at that, unfortunately. My sisters. That is like <laughs> cows, they get just enough. Yeah, and the boys Maybe are even mean, worse off. Yeah, yeah, the boys are much worse yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, nothing good happens to the boys. We don't want to leave that. Hello? Yeah, switch it on. So. Look at them. Hello? Okay. Um, I think maybe I will answer. I'll answer to you the first question a bit, uh, sort of contextualizing this project we presented, but I think it's related a bit to, um, yeah, I think sort of other ideas of mine are kind of trying to expand upon uh, this explanation of our interest or situated interest in success. Um, but um, anyway, it's gonna make sense. <laughs> but uh, um, basically, um, yeah, I, I there's there was uh, this part for me when I was going to this idea of architecture production studies, which was um, when I was reading this incredible book by Denise Ferreira da Silva um, called Unpayable Debt, and she describes. Um, colonization as a process of maximum extraction of value, and she couples that to uh, she couple anyway because she's trying to elaborate this kind of theory of value. Maybe I'll just give up. Um, and she couples that to uh, yeah, a mechanism that always also happens, which is uh. A maximum extraction of uh, energy. So to her, uh, there is this kind of uh, almost uh, thermodynamic basis to the processes of extraction of value with the colonial systems. Like the and when I read that, I immediately connected it to this uh, very seminal text to the field of architecture production studies by a thinker called Sergio Ferro, who describes the construction site as perhaps one of the most well-designed mechanisms for extraction of surplus value. Okay. And uh, to me, there was, uh, it kind of made, made it click because um, 
I think when it comes to architecture and the systems that uh, sustain it and how uh, lives are implicated in that, we usually see this these uh, these kind of energy expenditure processes very clearly when there is some sort of uh, excess expenditure. So when something breaks down, so for example, for the construction worker, that's some sort of injury or for the architect, it's burnout or something in those lines. And what I thought, uh, always thought was very interesting about this specific project is that first it is based on uh, a construction system designed by another architect and um, this construction system, and I think that uh, it's kind of an interesting connection to this idea of sort of good enough. Um, it it is based on uh, not being just good enough. So you're kind of actively trying to avoid stressing the systems through which the architectural object becomes possible. So you don't want to harm the construction worker. You don't want to overload the transport systems that you're going to use to carry this material. Um, in that way, I think uh, I see that as uh, fundamentally the sort of like careful or life affirming or life safe safeguarding uh, idea behind it. And then this other architect who is this male architect who unfortunately her work is very under documented. So it's also kind of we can only tease because there's only kind of <laughs> teasing <laughs> there's no substantial archive. Um, she takes that and she uh, kind of in this very relational way starts to expand upon it and understand the conditions for conditions for conditions or in a way the systems for systems for systems, right? When do you stop in order to make sure that this project uh, will kind of serve its intention <laughs> of, you know, affirming life and safeguarding life. Uh, so in a way that's it. And then there basically it was this just this very kind of complex, uh, yeah, it's very bureaucratic, but anyway, kind of departmental configuration where everybody was working uh, together in a sense that uh, a lot of the usual hierarchies in this process of uh, making the actual object was were completely ruptured, and um, I think what I would maybe call, let's say, a, a, a heightened awareness of the ways in which the the, the technology is specific to the architecture activity make you. Um, alienated in specific ways. So like the architect is alienated from the construction site and the construction worker is alienated from the decision-making process for the design. Um, those were through this kind of uh, working together of everybody. So the workers in the factory, the workers that are building it on site, the architects, the urban planners, the education department, the everybody <laughs> in there in this like a uh, you know uh, critical mass sort of um they, these uh, at least they became more aware of these specific forms of alienation and i think maybe then it's a good uh transfer to Catherine because i think from her kind of political theory background she would call that solidarity so <laughs> that's, um, yeah and then you can also maybe talk about nice examples <laughs> <laughs> No, it's important to use this opportunity to invite people to the event that we have for organized. This is your Yes, sorry. <laughs> you are having a pleasure to rehearse this, this new future with us during the Biennale in the summer of 2024, or like every time before it talks to us. We are, yeah. Um, so thanks so much for, for these questions. You, you asked us what kind of practices um we are excited about what kind of futures they are building that we would like to be part of and in a way this i would like to turn back a little bit to also what Sitara was saying this morning about archives and the fact that this project for instance is so under documented so during my studies here i did not learn during my bachelor's studies i did not learn about a single like a single even woman architect like they were 
maybe one, but they were not part of the curriculum, you know? And of course, it's not just about women and so on and so forth, but these projects that that show these masks, but also these futures that we want to be part of, they are always under documented. We always have to, you know, excavate them from some kind of archive. We always have, have to establish these lines and we think we are doing it for the first time. And it turns out it has been done all the time, always like the anarchist histories you were also referring to. So, so it's, I think one part of the futures we want to be part of is, is really also linking through the material with these sort of, uh, yeah, intergenerational questions and realizing that it's not a new question and that there are all of these, but the mode in which we think and and talk about architecture like systematically excludes those practices uh, from sites. And and then I think there's an, a next step, which is, yeah, what you were saying that maybe, and this is just also a hope um, in a way, maybe linking to these materials, these very concrete practices of building collectively that invite all kinds of beings to, to relate in a building site. You mentioned the, maybe a right or a freedom to build, um, that maybe that is actually a way in. And I think we are in a very, very exciting moment because there are, of course, it's horrible also, like I'm on the brink of tears for every, <laughs> every second because of you know everything that is going on in the world. Um, but I think also there is, a hopeful moment because, for instance, in architecture, very specifically, we are looking at all of these practices that also emerged in like the 2010s movement of the square situations, where all kinds of collective building practices are emerging all across the all across, and they are also maturing into a really like an ecological mode of building, using new materials, bringing people together. So there, I think it's very much, yeah, there are a lot of hopeful practices out there. Um, yeah, and that comes, I think, with sort of refiguring conditions for architecture. Yeah. I suggest we go to Maria and we end with Bruno. If I can already, you are, if you bring it back to Isaiah, just to, for him to, to set it up, the question uh, there are many planets out there, but there's only one with water, and water features is almost every single presentation today. Right? My understanding case that I have. Maybe we could have some more back. Um, okay, first, I think I owe an apology to everyone here um, for not situating the village uh, <laughs> properly. No, <laughs> no, 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 it's a very beautiful place. It's actually officially one of the most beautiful villages of Spain. <laughs> and it's, um, uh, and it's a castilla between the Rivera del Duero, which is uh, uh, the riverbed of the Duero Valley, a very nice wine area. And um, the Sierra de la Demanda, the least populated uh, or the least densely populated part of Europe. So this is sort of um, where, yeah, on this like eco boundary, that's where the village itself is. Um, and it's very beautiful. So if anyone wants to visit, um, I encourage yeah. them a lot to come by. Um, but yeah, um, the, well, yeah, there were a lot of questions. Um, but uh, one of them was also a bit like, why do they talk so much, I think, about the last generation? So um, the one of the prodigal daughter. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what? Just go through it. Okay, yeah, I'll just, I'll just go. Um, so I think I chose this one for the presentation um, because various reasons. And one is, um, of course, it's the sort of most historically the most recent one. So. It affects me most in my day-to-day -day life, um, and it is actually directly linked to me. So of course, um, it's so much about ancestral relationships, but um, the whole story. Um, another actor in the story, if I would tell the long version, is also my great grandfather. So this is why I'm, I've grown up with the story of Inocencia, and um, so I. I don't know. For me, it's a very important story, and um, that's why I wanted to share it. But also because in our current political climate, recently also here in the Netherlands, um, we're just seeing that we're like returning to uh, old ways of um, treating beings, treating our surroundings um, with violence. And so, just to yeah, to have these constant reminders of um, what is the outcome of it, and that we're actually trying to like now fight against it, um, or like some people are trying to fight against the violence that happened back then, but then these new waves of violence are coming. Um, so I think um, because of these two reasons, but of course, 
I could talk really a long time about all of the figurations, um, and I think they're all really interesting, and there's a lot in each one of them. Um, but yeah, they just they just emerged from this idea also, Captain says, I think that as a woman in architecture, you don't have like these um, fe uh, feminist role models, these feminine role models. And so um, in the beginning, also because this village is in a very Catholic part of Spain, um, the only role models you have is the Bible. So you have this like uh, duality of the virgin and the whore. And so from there, I started making like expanding the idea of what can a woman in this environment be? What can more than a woman in this environment be? Um, and that extended. So in the end, all of us are a mother and a daughter and a goddess and all of the things I mentioned. So um, that's sort of the idea behind it. I'll feel free uh, to. Uh, wow. I mean, what a wonderful event. What a great panel. It's, I mean, the whole day has been uh, exciting and, and, and inspiring. Um, so as a, I'm basically a literature professor, that's my, that was my training. And so I've got um, um, some uh, suggestions for further reading. Uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, again, cow works in the polder. Polder, polder. Anyways, yes, a title to die for. And it it made me think of one of my favorite Donna Haraway books that I don't see cited that often anymore, which is Modest Witness at Second Millennium. Onco Mouse meets Female Man. I'm not it, right. Cop with the copy yet. Yeah. Onco Mouse uh, trademark. Yeah, to, to <laughs> all, all the fine details, but there's a very robust uh, uh, treatment there from the mid '90s of the of, of the cyborgization of of extraction of value from poor little experimental mice who are genetically altered to have cancer, so that you can then study that and rest and and, and so. Um, that's, uh, uh, I think, um, uh, still uh, uh, fresh and, and, and just as terrifying as, as always. Um, the, um, so I recommend that to Victor especially to take a look. Um, uh, and, and for uh, uh, now, uh, is it um, Amina or Amrina? Amina. Amina? Uh, uh, Amitav Ghosh uh, was elicited at the beginning of Donna's talk yesterday, The Nutmeg's Curse, a really wonderful uh, 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 historical lesson for, for me. But while he was writing that nonfiction text, he was also writing the novel called Gun Island. Are you familiar with So, okay, so that, but for everyone, it, maybe not the world's best novel, but really fascinating, and it's all about Venice, and about the the, the uh, Bangladeshi uh, migration and how that and 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 migration broadly considered uh, as as things that living beings do on the planet, uh, in, including uh, human migration. So, um, uh, uh, for Gert, uh, uh, it was fascinating to learn how. The, uh, in a way that one moves from the materialist, uh, where the, the effort to kind of not see the shamanistic context of what's going on in the rock painting to to a to to an actually a willingness to let that uh, be part of the ethnography that's going on, and and it um, uh, a, a text that's been incredibly crucial in, in my recent thinking about this is called The Falling Sky, and I always like to proselytize for The Falling Sky, words of the Yanomami Shaman, Davi Kopanawa, everyone should, should check this out. And what we learn from the cosmotechnics of the Yanomami uh, through Davi's shamanistic experiences is that um, there, uh, I mean, the Zapiri spirits come down from behind the sky, but but there are also water beings who just live in who, who just live under the water. Uh, so uh, uh, 
and 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 then experiences that uh, in trance that take the young shaman uh, uh, trainees as it were, uh, into the into the water world. So I'm wondering if there's a uh, 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 just um, some congruence of 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 figuration, right? Which uh, of mythopoetic uh, world building through the those experiences and those stories that that are told in that context. So um, uh, let me mention and and, and uh, Andre asked me to talk about. Gaia. So let me mention that uh, I've got, uh, together with my collaborator, David McConville, we have a website called uh, Gaian Systems, which is actually and also the name of my book before writing Gaia, so which was sort of purposeful. But if you go to any browser and just type in Gaian.Systems, <laughs> you'll be taken to this site. And on this site, I've got a, a paper called Water Gaia. Uh, and this is uh, also, uh, this was an idea that Marvelous had, uh, and she and she spent years, and, and, and we tracked this through the correspondence in writing Gaia, she spent years trying to get James Lovelock, hello, Rosie, yeah, yeah, yeah. James Lovelock, to... To, to work with her on this idea that that the earth <laughs> remains a, a a water world because life has held the water on the planet whereas Venus once had water it's all gone now I mean you know for all it, it, to any well it's it I mean it's much too hot right and and Mars once had a whole lot more water we know from the geological formations and maybe there's some ice deposits left but it's mainly gone and the thesis is that it's gone because either light never began there in the first place to provide dynamics that would hold the water within the living systems or or if light happened to, uh, emerge, uh, it, it didn't make it through what's called the Gaian bottleneck, right? It, it didn't take control of, well, it didn't take hold of the planet uh, in, a, in, a, in a fully, uh, uh, yeah, in a global fashion that, uh, um, uh, that, that, that could uh, yield this retention of water at the planetary level. So it's a really fast, I, I mean, it's, so it's a, it's a theory. Uh, I think it's a very cool and nice, uh, but, but at, in the scientific debate, it's kind of, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not proven or anything, but it's a really good theory. Um, and let's see. Uh, and then, and the last thing is for Donna. Um, now, uh, our friend Scott Gilbert, about whom you've heard a fair amount, and you heard his his doggerel uh, 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 ode to symphoesis yesterday. So he's working on this major new paper called a symphoetic view of life, and it was and done it. So in studying in reading Scott's paper draft, I I, I this is what I think I now understand that. To have developmental symbiosis, you need a you need a biological kingdom that reproduces through embryos. So that would be plants and animals, uh, and so you get these developmental uh, uh, you you get these this inducement of cell change from the outside in in the in the. Uh, and the unfolding of tissue differentiation, for instance, in the animal embryo. And so that's when you get those, that symbiopoiesis. Uh, whereas in the fungi and the protists, you're still, uh, uh, you're in a non-embryonic modality. And it seems that then that's where that sort of discreteness uh, that we see in the lichen is, is, is maintained. So... Um, uh, so there again, I, I just think that 
what we're doing here, what Don has been doing uh, uh, for, for a while now is, is building this concept, is taking kind of the bare bones, uh, like a, uh, a carrier bag of a concept that didn't have a whole lot in it. Uh, it didn't have in it, it was problematic. <laughs> and we've sort of taken out the problematic stuff and have been putting in uh, 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 more cool stuff and more concrete stuff, especially with Scott like giving this a developmental biological substantiality. But then we see that it's a it's a malleable concept of being with or becoming with that uh, has, as we've seen all day today, uh, or at least in a, uh, you know a good number of the talks. Uh, a a, a, uh, a a teasing out of the possibilities of the concept, um, and so and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but it, at the same time, for me, it's good to have the biological foundation from which the concept uh, takes on uh, its its initial form uh, and to which it can be referred. Uh, 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 as one uh, further unfolds its possibilities. I think that's it. Thank you very much, Rino. Thank you. This is what I'd like to propose. We are approaching the moment, uh, and I suppose the drinks should be here any moment now. Uh, we have three tasks. Uh, uh, I would love both to say uh, uh, a word on our closing, but uh, uh, first, let's. Uh, um, our guests have, have been kind enough to sign your certificates, so you you won't uh, get the uh, souvenir uh, here. So let me let me know it before thanking you, uh, our special guest. Uh, so, uh, while I'm while I'm doing this, can you just wrap it up? Because I want to start wrapping up by thanking everybody for this like amazing wonderful day and uh, the all the strands that have been opening up created this creative web of thinking with and becoming with and this is going to be an ongoing becoming with and uh, maybe i just want to end with let's say an invitation to you all to help us continue this uh, in different ways so we are still hopeful that we can spin this project in some way further, at least in the direction of a publication potentially. And everybody else is also invited, if you're interested, to contact us uh, to contribute to it and to develop this further. And maybe, I don't know, maybe this is like a moment when we had discussed before with Fuzzy, um, if we want to develop this idea about, let's say, an architecture of post-humanities, how would we even go about that? There will be a lot of mutations happening to our universities in the coming years with new curricula and Theo Delft is uh, probably um, proliferating into other cities like Den Haag and Rotterdam and we will have new courses. One thing that will be coming up very soon is like something that's called the fifth quarter where the university encourages transdisciplinary interfaculty and interdepartmental minors within the master. We're trying to establish something like a post-human design course in combination with the industrial design faculty, uh, possibly also uh, um, uh, TPM, so policy management and maybe geoengineering. And we're still looking for, let's say, everyone who would like to uh, collaborate with us so that maybe these three ecologies, the environmental, the social, and the technological, we can combine them into different kinds of courses and that we can offer to our students to just prepare for uh, how did, yeah, we call it like the end of the Holocene. No? <laughs> so, um, so surviving the end of the Holocene and maybe the new role of design, what it could possibly mean in these times. And in that regard, I think, it's maybe also interesting to mention uh, that there's a few projects also further in the making. Uh, so, for example, what we're working on right now is specifically a new course that focuses on worlding and different types of concepts that are related to that. There will be a PhD course probably in the next year uh, where we expound on different kinds of concepts that enrich our understanding of worlding from different kind of uh, angles. And the other discussion precisely added under Savos' work is 
the extension uh, about natural technicities and understanding, so to say, the specific technicity that architecture or the built environment produces in this way. So, um, of course, we would be super happy if anybody is interested also developing the idea of what the epiphylogenetic, epiphylogenetic role of architecture is and how we could possibly spin that into kind of a new conception of design or designing built environments. Please get in touch with us. We're more than happy to collaborate with everybody. The, the book series running also now, so... Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, for the Still more self-promo. Just keep our website and Instagram in. <laughs> <laughs>